Israel. Whose land is it? This seminar is based on what the Bible teaches and on history. Actually, the Bible is amongst other things a history book. It's a book about Israel. God sent his son, the saviour of the world, as a Jew. He was born, lived and died and will come again to Israel, to the Mount of Olives, as a Jew. If you're a believer in Jesus, you'll want to make yourself aware of what the Bible teaches. And for those who are not believers and don't want to study the Bible, there are plenty of other historical books and archaeological resources to research, and we'll have a look at some later. This seminar is not about taking sides, but about discovering the truth. Let's bear in mind that God's desire is for all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 1.4, and that includes Jews, Muslims, and every other faith and religion that there is in the world. And that should be our desire too. And let's remember there are good and bad in all walks of life. There seems to be so much confusion and misunderstanding about the war in the Middle East more than I can remember in my lifetime. Many people are influenced by emotions that arise from what they see or hear, especially through the media, which is understandable, especially if you only have one source of information. Only watch one TV channel, for example. But a lot of it is misinformation, and many people know nothing of the history. We all know what happened on October the 7th, 2023, when about 1,200 Israelis were massacred, terrible things were done, people beheaded, women raped, babies cooked in ovens in front of their parents, and approximately 250 taken hostage out of a population of 7 million. Proportionally, it would have been 10 times worse if it had happened here in the UK. Let's compare the numbers. We have a population of about 70.1 million 10 times the size of Israel, and that could have meant 14,000 people massacred and 2,500 taken hostage. How might that have affected you and I? How might the UK have reacted? This seminar is a very brief summary of who has occupied the land over the last 4,000 years. There's so much more to be said, so I encourage you to do some study for yourself and, as always, check what I'm teaching because I'm capable of making mistakes just as every other teacher, so always check. The claims. Whose land is it? I'm sure we're all aware that over the years there have been many conflicts. Israel has gained and lost land and been persecuted ruthlessly, but why is it ongoing still? And why do both Jews and Muslims claim the, the land is theirs? Why can't they live in peace? What are the root causes? Why does so much animosity and hatred exist? First of all, let's have a look at a map of present day Israel. Around the map you can see Egypt, Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. Which other races live in the Middle East? Well, mainly it's Arabs and Muslims. There's a difference between Arabs and Muslims. By referring to Muslims, I mean people who practice the religion of Islam. Some Muslims are also Arabs. Arabs are people who speak Arabic as a native language and identify themselves as Arabs. But many Arabs are not Muslims and not all Muslims are Arabs. There are in fact Arab Christians living in the Middle East and in Israel. More than a billion people in the world are Muslim, but fewer than 15% of Muslims worldwide are Arabs. So let's bear that in mind when we think about the Middle East. Here we have a map of nations around the Mediterranean and in North Africa. And you can see that red arrow in the middle. That tiny little bit of land is Israel. By the way, have you noticed that the spelling of Muslim has changed to Muslim? over recent years? Do you know why? The change came about through pressure from Islamic groups because Muslim in Arabic means one who is evil and unjust. 
whereas Muslim in Arabic means one who gives himself to God. And if you want to do some study on that, well, here's a URL of my source. To make it more complicated, not all Muslims believe Israel belongs to them. There are factions within Islam that share different views, the same as there are factions within the Christian church that have different views. Just as error has crept into Bible teaching, so it has into the Quran. Let's take a look at some different Muslim views. Based on verses of the Quran, some Muslims argue that Islamic law has not recognised and will never recognise Jewish rights to the territory. Others believe the Quran states that the Holy Land belongs to the Jews for all times. By the way, 99% of Palestinians are Muslim and 1% Christian. Well, they were before the 7th of October. So who exactly are the Palestinians and where did they come from? Well, first, let's see what the Quran says about Israel. The Quran came into being in the early 600s AD. AD meaning the year of our Lord from the Latin Anno Domini. As I said, the Quran came into being in the early 600s AD when Muhammad, an Arab prophet, had an encounter with Allah and began the Islamic religion with a small group of people. It's evident that early Muslims understood that Jews were God's chosen people and had been given the land of Israel. An excellent book I've read by J. Seculo entitled Jerusalem, you might like to source that for yourself, refers to many verses of the Quran that confirm this. For example, here are two. O children of Israel, call to mind the special favour which I bestowed upon you and fulfil your covenant with me as I fulfil my covenant with you. That's Quran 2.40. And 17 verse 104 says, We, Allah, said to the children of Israel, Now dwell in the land. Interestingly, the Quran doesn't mention the word Palestine, but mentions Israel 43 times. It's a fact that the Jews were living in the land 2,600 years before Islam became a religion. But it's not that clear cut. We need to look in the book of Genesis and to look at Abraham to understand why so much animosity and hatred exists. Abraham, as he was called, was from Ur of the Chaldees, which is the present day Iraq. He was a Gentile, not Jew, because Jews didn't exist at that time. However, he was obviously a God-fearing man. Genesis 12, 1-3 The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So if you want to be blessed, don't just pray for peace in the Middle East, pray specifically for Israel. The Bible is absolutely clear about Israel belonging to the descendants of Abraham. So Abraham set off in obedience with his family and all his belongings, without Satnav or an A to Z, and he followed the Lord's instructions. Just imagine, and we're frightened to go out without our phones these days. God gave him and all his descendants the land from the north, south, east and west. And if you take a look at the map, you can see the length and breadth of the land that God promised Abraham. Let's now read from Genesis 15, especially verses 18 to 21. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadamites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, and Jebusites, from the river to the sea. Does that ring any bells? It's been quoted so many times recently, it's amazing how many people quote it, but 
don't know what it refers to or where it is on the map. God gave Abraham and his descendants all that land. The problem was, Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. As we know, Ishmael was the firstborn to Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian slave. And eventually, Sarah produced the promised Isaac. Ishmael was born out of Abraham and Sarah's unbelief and disobedience that Sarah would bear a son. But God is merciful. He understands our weaknesses. He doesn't throw us on the scrap heap when we make mistakes. He restores us through repentance and blesses us. But the consequences remain. And the consequence of Abraham and Sarah's unbelief didn't just affect them, it affected the whole world. I can't help feeling sorry for Hagar though. She was just a slave and she was used and abused to produce a son and heir. And after Ishmael was born, unfortunately, jealousy set in between the two women and the relationship began to deteriorate. So much so that Hagar ran away. And in Genesis 16, we read that an angel appeared to her and sent her back. And that must have taken some humility. Later, God made another promise to Abraham. He said, your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac. Genesis 17, 19 to 21. Eventually Isaac was born, but Sarah came to believe that Hagar's son Ishmael, now about 16 or 17, was mocking Isaac. She insisted that Abraham send them both away. Abraham loved Hagar and Ishmael, but he reluctantly gave Hagar bread and water and then sent them into the wilderness of Beersheba. They wandered aimlessly until their water was completely consumed. In a moment of despair, Hagar burst into tears. But God saw her and also saw her son crying from a distance away. The angel of the Lord opened Hagar's eyes and there was a well of water. The angel of the Lord told Hagar that God would make a great nation of Ishmael. To cut a long story short, in Genesis 21 verse 20 we read that God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert of Paran within the Arab culture and became a skilled archer and his mother got him a wife from Egypt. It makes me wonder if that was a deliberate act of rebellion against Ishmael's father's generational line. This story reveals a lot, particularly the root of the deep line jealousy and rejection that has traveled down the generational line of the Arabs and Muslims. So Ishmael was the father of the Arabs. The promise. The promise God gave to Abraham was reiterated to his son Isaac and grandson Jacob. And he later made a promise to the entire nation through Moses at Mount Sinai. And that was after their deliverance from Egypt, which we'll look at later. Meanwhile, let's remember the promise that God gave Abraham in Genesis 12, one to three. In Genesis 26, verse three, God said to Isaac, stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath that I swore to your father Abraham. And then to Jacob in Genesis 28 verses 10 to 15, God said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Jacob, in turn, 
bequeathed the land to his 12 sons. Each were allotted a section according to their size and they were given jurisdiction over it. The Promised Land Let's remind ourselves of when Israel was about to enter the Promised Land from Numbers 33, 51 to 56. God spoke to Moses on the plains of Moab at Jordan Jericho. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you, destroy all their carved images and their cast idols, and demolish all their high places. Now jumping to verse 55, but if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give you trouble in the land where you live. And then I will do to you what I plan to do to them. Why did God tell successive generations to drive out the people living in the land? Well, we can see now, can't we? Because they practiced sorcery, witchcraft and many forms of occult, for example, sacrificing babies. And the problem wasn't with the people, but their religious idolatrous practices. Why hasn't Israel ever fully occupied the land? In a word, disobedience. Now let's move through history to King David, the greatest of Israel's kings, who God said was a man after his own heart. David, however, as we know, was far from perfect. He committed adultery and murder didn't he? David had a son called Solomon, but Solomon inherited a spirit of immorality from his father, which led to having many wives and much compromise. He had one foot in the kingdom and one in the world. You can't serve two masters. Let's ask ourselves, if we're serving two masters, do we have one foot in the kingdom and one in the world? Solomon built altars on high places for each of his wives to worship their own God, which eventually, sadly, led to the downfall of Israel. He ignored God's instructions, which said, you must not intermarry, 1 Kings 11 verses 1 to 2. Let's ask ourselves, are we ignoring God's instructions about anything and reaping the consequences? We're all disobedient to varying degrees, but maybe this is a gentle reminder of how important obedience is to God. John 14 verse 23 says, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. The split. After Solomon's death, Jeroboam, a servant, led a revolt against Solomon's son, Rehoboam. The 10 northern tribes of Israel completely rejected King Rehoboam leaving him only Judah and Benjamin to rule. They took the name of the largest of the two tribes and became known as men of the kingdom of Yehuda or Judah. Rehoboam, we're told in 2 Chronicles 12 to 14, did much evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. He also compromised which is interesting, isn't it? Because that spirit of compromise must have been a result of Solomon's disobedience in marrying many wives from different races. And his mother was an Ammonite, which is also interesting. If you'd like to understand more about generational blessings and curses, why not check out our Foundational Truths online course? It's a four part course and one module focuses entirely on spiritual warfare. Intermarrying and intermingling distracts us from focusing on God. The Bible warns us against being unevenly yoked. And if you married an unbeliever before you were saved, it's so important to have fellowship with believers. Otherwise you'll find yourself compromising more and more until there's less of the word in you and more of the world. Anyway, the rebellious ten tribes in the north retained the name Israel and were governed by kings from Samaria. 
We read about Judea and Samaria in Acts, don't we? Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. But I wouldn't fancy being there right now because Judea and Samaria are what is currently known as the West Bank. King David extended the land as far as Turkey, but Israel have never occupied all the land God gave them. 300,000 square miles, which included Syria, part of Turkey, Jordan and Iraq, revealed in Genesis chapters 15 to 18, from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the river Euphrates in the east. And if you take a look at the map, you can see the um, the bit that's outlined in black is the land that God had promised to Abraham and the darker bit in the centre is the land that David conquered. Israel had repeated ups and downs because of their disobedience but God is faithful and his promises stand forever. If we don't believe God will keep his promise to Israel then how can we believe he will keep his promise of salvation to us? The word Palestine. So how did Israel become known as Palestine? As I said earlier, it isn't in the Quran, nor is it in the Bible. So where did it come from? In AD 70, the Romans crushed and took over Israel. In AD 132, a Jew named Simon Bar Kokhba led a revolt and regained Jerusalem for three years. But unfortunately, in AD 135, the Roman Emperor Caesar Hadrian executed him and retook Jerusalem. He dispersed the Jews and renamed it Palestina, later to become Palestine. Why? To humiliate them. The name Palestina was created from the word Philistine, Israel's Old Testament arch enemy. From then on, Arabs and Jews were known as Palestinians. Between 586 BC and 1948, the Jews were dispersed and the land was occupied by about 10 different powers, including the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Arab Islamic Empire, Catholic Crusaders, Mamluks, Ottomans and the British. But there was always a remnant of Jews living in the land. How can we be sure? Well, there is evidence. There is much archaeological evidence of Israel's existence in the land over the centuries. One interesting fact, for example, is of two ancient stones with markings on. They're called steles and they refer to Israel and King David. This one was Egyptian, found in northern Israel. It's known as the Tel Dan Stele and is 3,000 years old. It refers to the House of David, approximately 2,100 years before the word Palestinian was invented. The Balfour Declaration. Moving forward to the 20th century, I have to mention the Balfour Declaration, but this deserves an entire separate seminar. Briefly, however, in 1917, during World War I, the British defeated the Ottoman Turks. They took Palestine and amazingly, on the very same day in London, the cabinet office, who incidentally were nearly all Christian, I think as far as I understand, apart from one, they accepted the Balfour Declaration which acknowledged the need for a permanent home for the Jews. Land was allocated to them and accepted by international law. The very fact that it happened on the same day is thought to have been divine intervention by God. However, in 1922, Churchill, who was at the time Secretary of State of the British colonies, came under pressure from objections by the Hussein family and the land was divided. The east was given to Transjordan and the west remained Palestine. 
and I personally believe that this was the beginning of the downfall of Great Britain. We are no longer a great nation. And here you can see the promise of blessings and curses being outworked. So for many years Israel was called Palestine and if you were born in Israel between 135 AD and the 14th of May 1948 you would have been known as a Palestinian regardless of whether you were Arab or Jew. Golda Meir, the fourth Israeli Prime Minister, held a Palestinian passport. Under British rule, there were about 38 years of conflict, but on the 14th of May 1948, the prophecy in Isaiah 66 verses 7 to 8 was fulfilled and Israel became a nation. The state of Israel was born. Let me just read you that scripture. Before she goes into labour, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a son. Who has ever heard of such things? Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labour than she gives birth to her children. So the Jews had again some of the land that was rightfully theirs, but they only had a tiny portion of what God had originally given them. Fast forward into the present, Israel is once again at war, this time with extreme Muslims who want to occupy the land. It doesn't make sense, does it, when you think back to that map of the Middle East um, and Northern Africa, because there are 22 Arab states and 52 Muslim states in the world. Why would they want Israel? And you'd think that one of them would welcome the displaced Palestinians. But no, and Egypt has put up a massive wall defence to keep them out. You see, they don't just want the land, they want to annihilate all Jews. In fact, Hamas's founding charter states Israel will exist until Islam obliterates it. And the day of judgment will not come until Muslims fight and kill the Jews. By the way, did you know that another of their stated aims is that after they've achieved this goal, then they'll be coming for the Christians. So don't let's be complacent and bury our head in the sands. We can trace the roots of hatred, jealousy and rejection back to Hagar and Ishmael. Those spirits have travelled down the generational line, but the real root is deeper. Hamas sadly is doing the devil's work to prevent Jesus the Jew returning to Jerusalem to set up his kingdom, because that's when the enemy will be finally defeated. God promised to bless the nations through Abraham. Did you know that Jews are less than 0.2% of the world's population? But between the years of 2001 and 2007, 22% of Nobel Prize winners were Jewish. They excel in entertainment, medicine, literature, the list could go on. Of course, we know the main outcome of the promise God made to Abraham was and is Jesus, the saviour of the world, for those who choose to acknowledge him. So what can we learn and apply to ourselves? Well, God fulfilled his promise to Ishmael's descendants, didn't he? He gave them many nations and he gave them oil. God always fulfills his promises. Don't give up on what he's promised you. You may have trials and tribulations and have to exercise patience, but God is not a promise breaker. Remember that Obedience is the key to fulfilment. Disobedience has consequences, but when an individual, group or nation repents, he forgives and cleanses and restores. 1 John 1 9. Throughout history, civilizations have come and gone, but there's always been a remnant of Jews living in the land. Jews, Christians and Muslims 
all acknowledge that God gave Israel to the Jews. Whose land is it? It belongs to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The Jews are the indigenous people of the land. God hasn't finished with Israel yet. If we believe the Bible, things are going to get worse for them, sadly, when the whole world will turn against them. And we can almost imagine that happening, can't we? But Jesus is coming back. So if you want to be blessed in the meantime, don't just pray for peace in the Middle East. Pray specifically for Israel and for God to work out his purpose so that the whole world, regardless of colour, race or religion, may be delivered from deception and have the opportunity to acknowledge that Jesus is the King of Kings, the Saviour of the world. Amen.